Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church, our online service. It is Sunday morning, and uh, right now I am down in the youth room. So uh, we it's, it's backwards, but that is a countdown to our summer camp, 44 days. And we found out yesterday due to COVID-19 that that has been canceled. It's been a staple for what we do here. It's a student ministry. A lot of lives have been changed. A lot of students have accepted Christ for the uh, uh, as, as their Lord and Savior, and uh, it's, a, it's a big, big piece of our calendar for the year, and so it's, a, it's disappointing for students and for the staff, uh, but they've made a decision there crossing. So um, my name is Jay. I'm the youth pastor here. We want to welcome you on this Memorial Day uh, weekend. You're going to see a video. You're going to hear our worship pastor, Matt Macon, this morning, uh, Deacon of the Week, Brad McNeil. Um, and also, we posted a video, I believe two days ago, if you want to join one of our online Bible studies. So there'll be a link on our Facebook page. There's also a walkthrough of how to do that and how to, how to log on to Uversion and to find friends and to make friends on Uversion and also to pick a Bible study that will help you, another tool that will help you grow in the Word and the knowledge of your Word. I want to go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer this morning. And once again, thank you for checking out uh, if you want to log in anywhere down this thread, make a comment where you're from, who you're watching with this morning, we'd love to uh, hear from you. So let's, let's go ahead and let's open up a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we just thank you for your grace of another day. We thank you for the churches that uh, are throughout this community. We pray for those that are gathering in person. We pray for those that are ga gathering digitally this morning, Lord. Uh, you're bigger than all those uh, barriers or, or buildings or obstacles, Lord. And we just pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us, to challenge us, to transform us, Lord. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray this morning. Amen. Hey, have a great rest of the service. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning. My name is Matthew Macon. I'm the worship pastor at First Baptist Church in Carrollton. And this morning, I would love to share with you a piece of scripture from Psalm 100. This is a psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Good morning. My name is Brad McNeil, and I'm one of the deacons here at First Baptist Church, and we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. We also would like to thank you for your continued giving by way of tithes and offerings supporting the ministry of the church. If at any time you would like to give towards this ministry, a link on the screen will direct you in a moment. I'd like to read to you a passage today from Micah 6.8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the service. They are more than just names. More than blocks of stone set in rows more than memories. They are our brothers and sisters, our parents and our children. Friends, loved ones, and even strangers who believe that we were worth fighting for, that we were worth dying for. They stand for justice for courage, for heroism and fearlessness in the face of danger. They stand for the brave men and women who selflessly answered the call and gave their very lives for the cause of freedom. 
let us never take their sacrifice for granted, but instead remember with gratitude those who have served. Today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. By the grace of God, if we walk upon free soil, if we breathe in the sweetness of liberty, let us give thanks, let us honor the fallen, and let us never forget. Good morning, everyone. It is Memorial Day weekend, a day we set aside in our country to remember specifically those who have died in service to their country. I have behind me a um, wall hanging from our church that chronicles the names of all the local young men who served in World War II. As you can see, for a small community, that's a substantial number of people. The risk they took, the risk their families took, and the losses that were incurred and would have been incurred if these young men had not come home is so obviously far-reaching. So on this Memorial Day, remembering this long, long tradition in our country all the way back to 1868, a mere three years after the end of the Civil War, we are, we are remembering those who have died in service to their country. What we're really remembering is the great vulnerability that comes with wearing a uniform for, for a nation. Remember that, that those who take on the uniform choose that direction, unless, of course, like some theaters and seasons, the draft brought them in, but they still chose to serve. But, but there's so much they don't choose so much vulnerability they still experience, and that in many ways is what we are honoring. That is, they don't choose the beginning of the war and they won't choose the end of the war. They don't get to choose where the war takes place, whether it's on water, on land, in sky, whether it's in jungles, flatlands, mountains, cold, heat, rains, they don't, they don't choose the conditions for serving their nation in a war. They don't choose the war's leaders. They don't choose their own leaders. They don't choose the people they'll serve beside. They don't choose assignments. They don't choose when a war is occurring in the history of the world, nor do they get to choose when the war is occurring in the history of their own lives or their families' lives. And they all know the clock is ticking. The longer they are in a theater of war, the more likely the risk is they won't come home from that theater of war. Those are all the vulnerabilities that exist. And sometimes those vulnerabilities catch up and, and they don't get home. I have in my hands a most interesting document in this church, and this is a letter from a chaplain. <clears throat> Evacuation Hospital number 27, March 6, 1919, World War I, written from the chaplain, Clinton Bowman, to the pastor of First Baptist Church here in Carrollton, Kentucky. <clears throat> he says this, my dear sir, yesterday afternoon I was called to the bedside of one of our patients, Sergeant Otis Arvin, Company L, 9th Infantry, and found him very sick, suffering with a tonsillar abscess. It was soon learned that his greatest concern was not his physical suffering, but the approach of his soul to his Lord and Savior. He told me that some time ago he had accepted the Master as his Savior, had then determined to live as he would have him live. His particular desire yesterday was that he should be baptized and his name become a part of the church role of the First Baptist Church, Carolyn, Kentucky. Since I am not a Baptist minister and his condition would not permit, 
I realize that baptism after the requirements of your church, that is immersion, would be impossible for him. This was explained to him as I told him that I would refer his name with assurance of his conversion to your church for your action. He too realized this, as did I, but asked that I baptize him in the only way left for our use, which would be by sprinkling. He also expressed his willingness that should he be received as a member of your church and should survive his illness and return, that he would be baptized according to the requirements of your church. Those conditions existing and understood, I found it a joy to administer to him the sacrament of baptism according to the only practical method under the conditions. He was baptized just as the sun was sinking behind the hills beyond the Moselle River. And this morning, just as the same sun was rising from behind the hills beyond the Rhine River, his soul took its flight to its master. Please convey my deepest and heartfelt sympathy to the bereaved family, also the assurance that he gave every evidence of readiness and willingness to meet his Lord at the judgment seat. I am yours for service, Clinton D. Bowman, Chaplain, United States Army. You see, for all the stories of those who serve and come home, there were also these many, many stories of those who did not come home and knew they would not come home and died fully assured in faith in Christ and yet fully assured they would not see their family alive again. It is these complex stories that we remember on Memorial Day. Families who were never reunited, sons who never came home to mothers and fathers, sons who never became husbands and fathers of children and grandchildren. We remember them on this day and we honor them. Cover my iniquities, create in me a clean heart and renew right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence, don't take your spirit from me. joy of your salvation restore to me the wonders of your love restore to me the joy of your salvation restore to me restore to me And renew right spirit within me. Uh, don't cast me away from your presence. And uh, don't take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the wonders of your love. Restore me the joy of your salvation. Restore me, restore me. Deliver me from this hour of darkness and through the pain and brokenness. And I will sing of your love. Joy 
joy of your salvation restore to me the wonders of your love restore to me the joy of your salvation restore to me restore to me restore to me the joy of your salvation restore to me the wonders of your love restore to me the joy of your salvation restore to me restore to me Good morning. We begin today with a very familiar, familiar word, a word we use as an insult, a word we use as a pathology, but a word from Greek myth, the myth of Narcissus. So Narcissus, as the story goes, was a young man who found a pool of water, found the reflection of himself, and was simply unable to pull himself away. He was just so taken. So taken that he let love, a woman he loved, leave, a woman who loved him, leave, let it go, chose this time, chose the reflection, chose all things in this pool of water that would simply reflect his own reflection. So we, of course, have a word called narcissism out of this. It's it's just an unhealthy self-love, an unhealthy self-interest, this bad habit of simply seeing the world um, relative to how it affects you. And then, of course, there's the pathological piece where narcissism becomes something that, that, that only allows you to process the world through self validation. That is, there is no authority beyond you, but there also is just no authority behind the eyes beyond you. It's a pathology simply unable to even see how other people are seeing things and what it might mean for for them. A bit like a cyclops looking at a mirror. Now we might call that a teenager at some point in my life and yours, but this is more. It's an unhealthy, toxic level of self-interest. And pathologically, of course, it, it is this disfiguring antisocial behavior that's so destructive to relationships that that we classify it as a as a disorder but in fact toxic self-interest is something we all fight in our lives we all have to push back on on where self-interest is taking us and and how self-interest is making us see things and how self-interest creeps in and changes the shape of so much. In fact, that's a fight we fight, and it's a fight we, we should fight all of our lives. And one of the best ways to fight that fight, of course, is to find a, a greater cause, something greater than, than self. So while I'm here at Camp Kaisak locally, this is a greater cause. It was an Easter Seals camp Uh, for children with disabilities. And now it remains an open site for lots of people to walk and fish and simply enjoy this wonderful piece of ground. But, But volunteers keep it going. It's a greater cause. And those who are coming into this greater cause are getting better because of it and leaving behind some level of self interest for the interest of others. That's how we, that's how we do this. We come in, we change, and we feel and hope that some of these these greater causes will change us. As far as we see things as followers of Jesus, we have a greater cause, of course, that, that comes from the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our greater cause is the kingdom of God among us, the kingdom of God within us, the kingdom of God alive in our own lives, our own hearts on this earth as it is in heaven. We are concerned about God's reign on earth, specifically God's reign on earth in our own lives. 
it's a greater cause. It's how we live, it's how we serve. And so this weekend, Memorial Day, where we think about greater causes, we are gonna think about the greater cause of the kingdom of God in our, in our own lives. The kingdom of God cause that's beyond nation, beyond nationality, beyond ethnicity, beyond gender, beyond age, beyond era. The kingdom of God. And recognizing, of course, the rule of this kingdom in our lives doesn't come easy. And few people illustrate the price of getting there like John the Baptist. And that's where we go first. The story of John the Baptist is one of the most vibrant, colorful pieces of, of, of all the Gospels. And that's because John was a larger than life figure in the time. In Luke 3, we find him as an adult in his work and ministry of being a precursor to Jesus and pointing the way to Jesus. But here we find him having come out of the desert community, Elijah-like, and preaching this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Keep in mind, he's preaching to fellow Jews. And second, he's asking them to publicly humble themselves before other people by repenting of sins and accepting, again, a very public baptism. He's calling for people to change and obviously change. And this is a bit of his sermon from Luke chapter three, beginning in verse seven. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from this coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So John is speaking to people and giving very, very concrete applications for what it means to repent. On the backside of this is, is the obvious, obvious point that people had found a way to keep faith in God with unfaithfulness. They found a way to do that. And of course, that's what people do. People find a way to keep faith while still being unfaithful. But John says, produce fruit. I mean, an apple tree should produce an apple. And if you truly are repenting and following God, the deeds of your life should show it. We all know that over decades and centuries within Judaism, within Christian faith, the early, early events, say for example, a bush that is on fire but never burns up, like Moses' story, becomes something else. It's no longer fire, it becomes hand warmers. And we are a long, long way from the fire of faith, the, the, the truth of faith, what is life changing about faith and, and changing our mind about faith. And, and then these habits and doxologies just become ends in themselves. And so John is saying, become the tree and then produce the fruit of the tree. And when he says, don't lean on or call out for Abraham, he's telling them, don't just sit back and say, well, I'm Jewish, why should I care? I'm Jewish. And it's John telling them, God doesn't need a Jew, a Jew needs God. And so he would tell us, God doesn't need a Christian, it's a Christian that needs God. It's a human that needs God. 
And so don't reach out and put this robe on that you think frees you from the price of decision-making and from the consequences of decisions. John says the tree should reveal the fruit. And if you have repented, the fruit should be obvious. You see, in John is this call for the greater cause. John could have settled for a lot of things within the hot topics of Judaism of his day. He could have preached on better temple attendance, better synagogue attendance. He could have preached on moms and dads and kids and respecting parents and caring for children. That sermon was available. He could have preached on marriage. He could have preached on divorce. He could have preached on Rome and one's relationship to Rome or prayer. There's lots of things John could have talked about, but they're all coming out. And his basic message is about the kingdom, the kingdom of God calling for truth in living, truth in belief, and that faith in God would be marked by faithfulness above all else. It's the greater cause of the kingdom. And we should note in a story like this that the kingdom of God asks for us to change. In fact, the kingdom of God re requires change. It requires that we change the way we think about ourselves that we get far more honest and realistic. It changes the way we think about God. It also changes the way we think about our neighbors. It asks us to repent first and to worry about the world second. I can control if I repent and change. I can't control if my enemies repent and change. I can't go find a brood of sinners and make them change, but I, I can put some work into this sinner changing. That's the kingdom of God, the awareness of God, the closeness of God, and this is how I'm supposed to think about God. The kingdom of God is not a robe. It's a call to repent and to change and to align ourselves with God and God's best. So, we have occasional stories that reveal this and this idea played out in our house the other night. So I was at the table, Jen was on the couch and she was looking at someone on Facebook had contacted her about a woman who was wrapped up in a sleeping bag on the front porch of our church building downtown. And she was concerned about the woman and therefore was contacting Jennifer and then Jennifer started asking me questions and I'm answering back. But by the end of the end of the discussion between that friend and her and me, all of us thinking through a kingdom of God lens of loving one's neighbor, I ended up, it was a cold night. This is why the phone call came in. I got up, got a coat, went downtown and, and checked on her. Now, she is someone who does this occasionally, and so I know who she is, and we try to keep up with her as best we can, but it was cold. And so someone with the greater cause of the kingdom said she should not be out there cold tonight. And so she does her kingdom work calling Jennifer. Jennifer does her kingdom work giving me the eye, and I take the eye, and I get my coat, from her kingdom work to go do my kingdom work, to go check on how she is and, and that she's warm and she's okay. That she matters to us is a perspective of, of, of the kingdom, the greater kingdom, not what I've done in a day, not what she's done in a day, not who should be inside, who is not inside, not who should have to look after, who shouldn't look after her, all these ways we get lost. The kingdom perspective is contact Jennifer. Kingdom perspective is ask Chris. Kingdom perspective is Chris, get your coat and go make sure she's okay. This is what we do. I got a phone call a day or two ago, just out of the blue, a, a woman called the church and all she said was, she gave her name. I didn't know the name. She said, she said, can you give me 
for a prescription. And I said, Kingdom Eyes, sure, I've got $5. I can give it to you for a prescription. And then she said, can you bring it to me? And, and I said, um, maybe, I don't know, where do you live? And then we, we begin this conversation of back and forth. Just back and forth, trying to figure out how she gets help, how she gets her prescription. In the end, her son ended up bringing her by later, got the money, went and got the prescription, was adamant about wanting to come back and, and show me show me her prescription, that, that this is what the money was used for. But we take those phone calls. We take those knocks at the church door. We take people seriously. And it, it's just a discipline of, of the kingdom. It, it's, it's believing that God's lens in, includes us, but is, is greater than us. That's a kingdom lens. It's also, of course, for us coming back and considering what it means to be followers of the one who loves the world and was crucified for the world, we all, we come back to these. And so we find in ourselves this need to keep repenting of our own self-interest and considering the interest of others. John, John is preaching a kingdom of God and it's a difficult calling, but it's our calling. It's a place to begin and, and, a, and like behind me, a uh, path to follow which I'm gonna to follow to give you the next piece of the message. So, as I just mentioned, the kingdom of God should give pause. The kingdom of God makes us slow down and reconsider things, even if it means we give up or we lose, or we don't turn out to be the good guy in the end. We give pause because the kingdom asks for things that other people aren't, aren't asking for. But the greater cause of the kingdom is actually oriented toward the greater person of the kingdom. It's a very person-centered idea, this kingdom of God. And Jesus, of course, being that, that person. He is the one to whom John is pointing. And the scripture sp speaks of John being the one who's come ahead of him to prepare the way for him and to be pointing to him. In John's gospel, it's an interesting piece that we, we learn that both John and Jesus have disciples early and their ministries are parallel. And then there's some conflicts and John's disciples come back from having been with Jesus and his disciples, and they're a little put out that Jesus is gaining in numbers and disciples and popularity, even greater than, than John. And, and they're, they're defensive for John. And so we have this story and this piece and John's response to it. This is from John chapter three, verse 27. To this John replied, a man re can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater I must become less. John's disciples are threatened by the rise and reach of Jesus, whereas John only speaks of the joy of the reach of Jesus. John speaks of himself as the ancient world's best man. That is, in the ancient world, the best friend of the groom had some major responsibilities in preparing for the wedding. He wasn't the groom. He was not going to be with the bride, and yet his experience was a point of great joy. It's his best friend he's taking care of. It's his best friend he's, he's shepherding along. And he will experience a certain joy because of the joy of 
the groom himself. And John says, that's the joy I'm after. Jesus is the groom. And in the language of the church, his bride is, is the church and the world and his people. And John does not want to get in the way of the joy of the groom and his bride, but there's his own joy at watching the bridegroom be united with his bride. So that's the attitude at the heart of this. And John says, he must become greater, I must become less. This is the other side of the kingdom of God. It is person-centered. And Jesus rises and we become less, not discarded, not unwanted. But in terms of importance, Jesus rises far, far higher and greater than any of us. And we are those who enjoy the joy of Jesus for people. And we are those who want to do all we can for the kingdom of God to come through all of us and in all of us, knowing that it brings joy to God, specifically through Christ. The best confession really comes from Paul in the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians chapter 4, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and following. It's not Paul saying, I'm going to give God my worst self. It's Paul saying, I'm willing to give up my best self. If my best self is in the way, of God's best in me, then I'll give up my best self. That is, that is an orientation toward a person, an orientation toward the Lord Jesus, who is Messiah and Lord and Rabbi. We orient toward him and we elevate him all we can. And we find joy in other people finding joy in him, even if it means they might not find joy as much in us. And I, I understand some bit of this. Um, a story I'll tell you, it's some years ago, at a funeral, I was in line like everyone else, and it was a long, circuitous line through the building. And it was sad enough at this funeral, but I, I remember being in line, and looking ahead at the line, and realizing that I knew almost everybody in line ahead of me. But I knew all of them because they all had been part of our church once upon a time. Once upon a time, I had seen them every Sunday. Many of them I'd been in their homes. But we'd been here a long time and lots of years pass and lots of changes come. And I'd realized that all the people I was looking at, they had all been in our church at one time and they had all left our church. So I was looking at all of them, none of them, none of them joining us for fellowship anymore. Not robbing banks since they'd left, but that didn't seem to be that important. What mattered to me, what hurt to me, and where I was guarding my own reputation is feeling like I, I had lost all of those people. That if I'd been more faithful, they would be here. Which, which then led to me wanting to guard my reputation and wanting to be good in their eyes and good in everybody's eyes. And so I stood in that line and just looked at them and I didn't do anything except stand in that line and, and wish I'd found a way for them to stay 
And to be honest, some reason why I wish I'd found a reason for them to stay is so I would have felt a lot better at that moment about my life, about my work. And in fact, what I should have done to become less that Jesus might become greater. What I should have done was walk down that line and reconnect with every one of them. What I still shared with them was far greater than what I didn't share with them by them not being in our church anymore. But that's where we get lost. We start guarding our reputation and maybe be, being jealous of other people's success and what they own and what they have. What I should have been doing in that line is walking person by person and asking about how they're following Jesus today and celebrating every way they're following Jesus today, even if it doesn't include me. That's what I should have done. That sounds like a far more Jesus thing to do. But that's where this is difficult. Jesus should become greater through our adherence to the kingdom of God. Our repentance should make Jesus look more in control of our lives. Our gentleness should be, should be obvious. But this is the call of the kingdom, to be centered on Christ. And as Christ would live in a day in a situation, we would live in a day in situation. And to be willing to, to change and remove these robes, these well-practiced versions of faith that might not require much faithfulness and return indeed to, to the more primitive way of bushes that are burning and don't burn up. The God who called us to follow and returning to how we started in all of this, returning to the habits, returning to the practices, returning to the people and simply asking God, what would you have me do today? to fulfill the kingdom call in my life, that, that, that greater cause. That, that's something we can be doing all the time, every day, in fact. And I encourage you as well, let the kingdom of God be your greater cause. There's lots of them, and I'm involved in a bunch of them. But there is a cause in the kingdom of God that is the great cause the cause that causes us to change like no one else can ask us to change. And the one who asks us to change our orientation and to consider the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might become greater and we might become less. Less and lose nothing. Less and gain all. Would you join me as we pray? God, thank you for this hour, for this day, this moment, all the days that have brought us to this day, all the days ahead of us, I ask God that you interrupt all of our lesser versions of you, all of our lesser versions of God and grace and faith and replace them, replace them with fire, replace them with, with truth and replace them with your closeness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's great to see you. Please keep an eye out for the weeks to come. We are still continuing to consider in the next few weeks when we will meet again for worship at the church site. And as soon as that is worked out, we will let everyone know as soon as possible. God bless you all. We hope you've had a great morning this morning. We hope you've been challenged uh, by the, the Word of God. And, and we also hope that you felt like you engaged and you connected um, through worship, the various ways that we're, we're trying to connect in worship digitally. So um, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life that we believe will be to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and what you do with Jesus. And we would love, absolutely love to engage in those conversations with you if that is something that you're thinking about and you want to know how... Um, somebody becomes a Christian, how, how somebody uh, 
puts her faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we'd love to talk to you about that. In Vacation Bible School, we walk through children and, and we talk to them, the ABCs. Uh, A, admit to God that we're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus was God's son and God raised him from the dead. And C, confess him as Lord and make him uh, the centerpiece of our life. And um, if that's you, we would love to hear from you. If, uh, if you are thinking about that and you want to know next steps, or maybe you've been there for a while and you uh, want to know how to grow and how to get connected at a deeper level and be connected with other believers, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. Please message us, reach out to us, and we will uh, love to talk to you. We'll go ahead, and uh, our benediction is going to be up on the screen this morning. I'm not going to read it. Uh, we're going to give you about 15 minutes of silence, and, and you read it, and then that will close uh, our, our service here this morning. So uh, check out the verse up on the screen. It has been great being gathered with you. Youth group is tonight, uh, Sunday night. Uh, and if you're watching this later on, Youth group is a Sunday night at 8.30, and Wednesday night at 8.30 as well will be uh, on YouTube. So have a great week. Here's our benediction.